Hello, good morning, friends. Uh, welcome to God's Eagle Ministries. My name is Ambassador Orojo Mande Ogwe. God's Eagle Ministries, we are seeding the nations with God's Word and God Himself is transforming lives through His timeless truth. We are one in Christ Jesus, so let's stay one. Today is Wednesday, the 9th of November, 2022. And um, Otakada content count for you today is uh, 2,220,732. Okay, uh, the title today is Perfect Relationship 24 Tools for Building Bridges to Harmony and Taking Down Walls of Conflict in Our Relationships. Understanding Your Temperament and That of Others, Episode 3, Part 2. We've done Episode 4, but we didn't complete Episode 3, so that's why we brought. Uh, back episode um, three but in part two and here we're looking at strengthening our weaknesses okay so um, and the keywords today is Christian unity relationship nightmares relationship pitfalls relationship please love agape conflict harmony storms understanding relationship temperament episode three part two perfect relationship Tim Lahaye trait character personality personality test temperament test um, relationship unity holy spirit uh, again wednesday 9th of november uh, 2022 so before i go on i would like us to pray heavenly father we just want to thank you for the privilege again to see another bright and beautiful day thank you for uh, your love and your care and your protection thank you for breath thank you for oxygen <laughs> we're not paying for it thank you lord god almighty for uh, health thank you for shelter thank you for um, the gift of access to your throne 24 7 and so and um, thank you for the privilege to share your word i ask holy spirit even as we uh, uh, go into this session that you breathe life upon this content, breathe life upon me. I hide behind the cross, and as I speak, I speak with your authority. I speak using my voice to speak to your people and speak to me as well. That at the end we will grow by it, we will be fruitful in our relationships in the name of Jesus Christ. And Father, I come against every contrary wind. Uh, that want to sabotage or misconstrue uh, whatever is being communicated now i bought them now by the authority in the name of jesus i declare that the crooked paths are made straight i declare that the mountains are leveled uh, brought down removed i declare that the rough roads are made straight the glory of your name in the name of jesus christ amen and so um this morning again we are looking at perfect relationship 24 tools for building bridges to harmony and taking down walls of conflict in our relationship understanding your temperament and that of others episode 3 part 2 strengthening our weaknesses uh, friends welcome to episode 3 part 2 today i would like to make a categorical statement here concerning conflict and storms in relationship this is it you are going to have conflicts and you are going to have storms plenty in your relationship with husband and wife, children, sibling, extended family members, in-laws, neighbors, communities, with church members, pastors and their members, the nation as a whole and between nations as well. God does not create conflicts, but God permits conflicts so that we can grow and be productive. The pruning process as typified by Jesus in John 15 is a classical example of how God cuts us back so that we can be more productive in our relationship with him and with others. Read it. It's all about relationship, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters. A relationship without conflict is a relationship waiting to collapse without warning, warning sign. If you say, I want zero conflict in my relationship, it is equivalent to saying, I want to learn to ride a bicycle without falling, or I want to learn to work without failing, uh, falling. Conflicts in relationship is not a sign the relationship is failing it is a cry for growth it is when we refuse to respond that failure is inevitable you cannot pray conflict away you can manage them one core ingredient to harmonious relationship between comfort and i have uh, uh, relationship comfort and i have learned i repeat that you cannot pray conflict away 
you can manage them. One core ingredient to harmonious relationship Comfort and I have learned within the last 22 years was that we made up our minds at the beginning to pray together and to keep the communication line going no matter the conflict that is in the front burner. Resolve 99% conflict through the written word of God. We keep the horizontal and the vertical communication lines between us open and also between us and God. In today's episode, we will be exploring the basic temperaments of four comprising sanguine, choleric, melancholy, and phlegmatic, which were acquired through the Adamic fall, and the nine temperament of the fruit of the Holy Spirit as we look at the role of the Holy Spirit, the need for continuous infilling of the Holy Spirit in helping us develop the nine temperament fruit in Galatians 5, 21 to 23. You will also secure opportunity to be baptized in the Holy Spirit in this episode for those who haven't done so and are willing to follow the five simple step process outlined in this post. If you have not carried out the temperament test yet, I encourage you to do that. You can find it in the first part of episode three uh, or also in this uh, episode as well where you can download the content and use in our home of six members. None of us share same temperament. As we renew our minds, the trait keep changing. It is a daily growth process if we're willing to partner with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit helps us uh, to strengthen our weaknesses and we will see how this is done in this uh, post. We'll be exploring strengthening our weaknesses in our relationship as encouraged by Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 12. The process of renewal of the mind as depicted in chapter 12 of Romans centers around making changes in our minds that will help foster a peaceful relationship within and outside our circles on how to relate with one another in a perfect relationship as God ordained it to be. Why is there so much talk and writing about relationships in the scripture? It's because relationship is a sine qua non for God's kingdom because kingdom matters rises and falls depending on the quality of our relationship. That is why Jesus said we will be known as disciples by the love we have for one another. I will read John 13:35, uh, And God is love. 1 John 4, 7 to 21. We can't have God kind of unity in the body of Christ without God kind of relationship. We can't have God kind of relationship without God kind of love. So let's look at uh, Romans chapter 12 in detail and then I'll bring you how we can strengthen our weaknesses so that our relationship can be, me- can be meaningful as we explore our temperament and that of others with whom we relate so that we can work work together in unity and reflect kingdom core principles. I will be highlighting some key words in Paul's admonition in Romans chapter 12 that relate to strengthening our weaknesses. And I start with Romans chapter 12 uh, verses 1 to 16, Amplified Bible Classic Edition. I appeal to you therefore, brethren, and I beg of you in view of all the mercies of God to make a decisive dedication of your bodies, presenting all your members and faculties as living sacrifice, holy, devoted, consecrated, and well-pleasing to God which is your reasonable, rational, intelligent service and spiritual worship. Verse 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, this age, fashioned after and adapted to its external, superficial customs, but be transformed in the bracket change by the entire renewal of your mind. I highlighted by that be transformed and change by the entire renewal of your mind by his new ideals and his new attitude so that you can you so that you may prove for yourselves what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of god even the thing which is good and acceptable and perfect in his sight for you verse 3 for by the grace and merit of favor of God given to me, I warn everyone among you not to estimate and think of himself more highly than he ought, not to have an exaggerated opinion of his own importance, but to rate his ability with sober judgment. Mark the word, rate his ability. Each according to the decree of fate apportioned by God to him. <coughs> Sorry then. 
For as in one physical body we have many parts, organs, members, and all of these parts do not have the same function or use, so we, numerous as we are, are one body in Christ, Messiah, and individually we are parts of one, of one another, another, mutually dependent on one another, having gifts, faculties, talents, qualities that differ according to the grace given us. Let us use them. He whose gift is prophecy, let him prophesy according to the proportion of his faith. He whose gift is practical service, let him give himself to serving. He who teaches to his teaching. He who exhort, uh, encourages to his exhortation. He who contributes, let him do in simplicity and liberality. He who gives aid and superintends with zeal and singleness of mind. He who does acts of mercy with genuine uh, cheerfulness and joyful eagerness. Let your love be sincere, a real thing. Hate what is evil, loathe all ungodliness, turn in horror from wickedness, but hold fast to that which is good. Let love one another with brotherly affection as members of one family, giving precedence and showing honor to one another. Never, he says, never lack in zeal and in earnest endeavor, that's verse 11, be aglow and burning with the Spirit, serving the Lord. Verse 12, rejoice and exult in hope, be steadfast and patient in suffering and tribulation, be constant in prayer, contribute to the needs uh, of God's people, sharing the necessities of the saints, pursue the practice of hospitality, bless those who persecute you, who are cruel in their attitude toward you, bless and do not cost them, rejoice with those who rejoice, sharing uh, others joy and weep with those who weep sharing others grief and finally uh, verse 16 which i also highlighted love live in harmony with one another do not be haughty snobbish high-minded exclusive but readily adjust yourself to people things and give yourself to humble tasks never overestimate yourself or be wise in your own concerts if you look at this scripture highlighted above, you will see that there is need to strengthen our weaknesses relative to our unique temperament so that we can be better ambassadors of Christ here on earth. If you don't know your temperament, following the last post, uh, uh, you can download the form or run tests online via uh, the link that we have provided in this post today. Let's explore the temperament test uh, from Tim Lahale below. So there's a link there. Uh, and the point here that I wanted to make, there are about three links there. This test can be con conducted every two years to see your level of growth in the Lord as the Holy Spirit help you in developing the nine fruits of the Holy Spirit. Better still, you can visit um, those links, uh, the link, uh, the link that provides you uh, when we talked about the posts initially. Now, let's explore how we do that from Tim Lahaye book, Why You Act the Way You Do strengthening your weaknesses so let's go one thing about temperament it never changes if your parents genes combine to make you a close son a male flag or a son male flag you will never be anything else like your appearance height and iq your temperament will be a part of you as long as you live and remember your temperament probably has more to do with your current behavior than anything else in your life the rest is a result of your childhood training, home life, education, motivation, and other things. The following formula, we put it all together. That is, if you uh, look at inherited temperament, uh, which came from the Ad Ad Adamic form, uh, childhood uh, training, uh, parental love, life's experiences, habit, plus education, plus self-discipline, -dis plus motivation, plus mental attitude, plus health equal to your uh, behavior. Now, as you look over this list, you are probably stuck with the realization that you have very little control over most of the ingredients in this formula. Don't be deceived. It is true that you cannot change your temperament, but there are three things that formula, that formula, in that formula that you can do uh, to control. So it's so can so that you can improve your temperament and change your life motivation mental attitude and habit your motivational potential 
when God created Adam, he made him unique from all other living creatures. He gave him a soul. This soul not only has a capacity for God, but is a source of external motivation that is all but untapped by most people today. But it does account for the tremendous transformation that occurs in people when they have a born-again experience with Jesus Christ. To understand this, you must realize the four parts of the human nature as described in the Bible. Jesus Christ knew more about human nature than anyone who has ever lived. He showed for he was the creator of man in the first place. And he said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. That is Mark chapter 12, verse 30. Notice carefully the four aspects of human nature heart, soul, mind, strength. Notice these are the following chart. Now, your inherited temperament probably resides in the heart where it influences the method of your thinking, not the content. It can be influenced by the mind, the soul, and heart. It is what the Bible means uh, when heart it is what the Bible it is what the Bible means when it speaks of flesh or nature or natural man. So there's a diagram there you will find on uh, there's a, 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 a picture that you find on our website. So let's look at the natural man. Christ is not the natural man. He's outside man's life. He looks. He knocks at the door of our life through the convicting of the Holy Spirit in preaching, tracks, radio television, personal witness, etc. If God's spirit is not within him, he will experience a guilt, fear, emptiness, misery, purposelessness, confusion, and other negative things pictured above. The amount of negative feelings will depend on his willing willfulness and sin. His greatest need is his emptiness. His unfilled God-shaped vacuum that Pascal said was in the heart of every man and can be filled with no one save Jesus Christ. This emptiness that plagues mankind all through life cheats man not only out of God's daily presence in his life but also out of his power to improve his temperament which was acquired through the Adamic form. Okay, God never forces his way into a person's life. He leaves it to an individual to decide whether or not to receive Christ as his Savior and Lord. But if you believe Jesus Christ died for your sins and rose again the third day, you can humbly repent of your sins and submit your will to him by praying a simple but beautiful prayer like this, O oh God, I know I'm a sinner and I have willfully disobeyed you many times. So you can repeat that after me. O oh God, I know I am a sinner and I have willfully disobeyed you many times i believe jesus died for my sins and rose again that i might have eternal life therefore i invite you to come into my life to both save me from my sins and to direct my future today i give myself to you as many as receive in jesus to them give he power to become the sons of god as john 1 12 all who believe in him are born again and have two natures the new one is a new man in Christ, opening up a whole new source of power. The old nature still wants to sin. Old natures are alive. Which one is dominant depends on which one you feed the most. If you feed the old nature, the food of the sin sick culture that surrounds us, don't be surprised when the weaknesses of your temperament dominate you. If, however, you feed your new nature, the spiritual food of the word of God, things pertaining to God. Your new nature will become so dominant, it will overcome the natural weaknesses of your temperament. Enable God to make maximum use of your inherited strengths or talents. Who is in control? We hear a lot in our humanistic culture about taking control of your life. <laughs> that sounds good at first. But if you look deeper into this cult of self actualizers you will uh, find the worst sin of all, selfishness. God wants to control your life. He makes no secret of that. He challenges us, therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. 
then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, perfect will, Romans 12, 1, 2, which we read earlier. Who controls your life? It is not hard to tell. Ask yourself, do I do what Jesus Christ wants or what I want? Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandment. It is ridiculous to sing, oh, how I love Jesus, while doing as you please with your life. When Christ is in control, you will do what he tells you in his word. Now, let's look at the three modern lifestyles. There are only three possible lifestyles today. You should analyze which is yours and see the result, see the result of that kind of life and what you really want. Let's look at the first one, Christ-controlled Christian. Note the similarity of results in the two lifestyles pictured above. So if you look at our website, the pictures are there. If you follow the link, uh, you'll get it there. Note the similarity of results in the two lifestyles pictured above where self is on the throne. The only real difference between one and two is that Christ was at one time invited into a Christian's life and he will go to heaven when he dies. But he is as miserable as an individual who doesn't know Christ. In fact, sometimes he is more miserable because the Holy Spirit can convict him from within. Both of these individuals will be dominated by their natural temperament weaknesses. The third drawing illustrates the individual who has surrendered the center of his life to Christ or most of the time lives this way. No one is perfect. We all give in to the flesh on occasion, but at least this person has a capability of living up to his divine potential. Now, let's look at how to strengthen your weaknesses. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old has gone. The new has come. Second Corinthians 5.17 one of the fundamental promise premises of the Christian life is when a natural individual is indwelled by a supernatural power, he ought to be different. Think about that. If God is really in your life, you will be different than if you were not. But it is also true that growth takes place slowly. You don't see much growth in a fruit tree on a daily basis. But there's growth if the tree is alive. So it is with the Christian. The growth in us is painfully slow sometimes, but it does take place. Now the power to change. What would be different after the Holy Spirit of God comes to reside in you? Your looks? Unfortunately not. Not. Will you get smarter? No. What changes? Your emotions. The Holy Spirit of God brings emotional stability into our lives. Paul describes it in these words. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Self-control, Galatians 5, 22-23. As you study these verses, you discover nine specific strengths that God provides the Christian to enable him to overcome his emotional weaknesses. The Spirit-controlled Christian will be an emotionally controlled Christian. The nine emotional strengths of the spirit-filled temperament make any temperament what God originally intended. It does not matter what one's natural temperament is. Any man filled with the Holy Spirit, whether sanguine, choleric, melancholy, or fragmented, is going to manifest these nine spiritual characteristics. He will have his own natural strength and maintain his individuality, but the spirit will transform his weaknesses. These nine characteristics represent what God wants each one of his children to be. We shall examine each in detail. There is a longing in the heart of every child of God to live this kind of a life. It is not the result of man's effort, but the supernatural result of the Holy Spirit controlling every area of a child, of a Christian. So let's look at the first one, love. The first characteristics in God's Catholic catalog of spirit-filled temperament trait is love. Love for God and for our fellow men. The Lord Jesus said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. That is Mark chapter 12, verse 30. Now, a love for God that causes a man to be more interested in the kingdom of God than in the material kingdom in which he lives is supernatural. For man, for man by nature is a greedy creature. The Christian who says he is filled with the Spirit but is unmoved by the suffering of others is kidding himself. If we have the love of God flowing through us, it will benefit others around us. I must also point out that love, God's Spirit, provides, makes us want to obey Him. 
If you like to test your love for God, try this simple method given by the Lord Jesus Christ. If you love me, keep my commandments. Just ask yourself, am I obedient to his commandments as revealed in his word? If not, you are not filled with the Holy Spirit. The second uh, emotion or fruit that uh, the Holy Spirit has provided is joy. After love, joy, which is uh, two of nine. The second temperament characteristic of the spirit-filled man is joy. One theologian gave this command, comment concerning the gracious emotion of joy. Yes, joy is one of the cardinal Christian virtues. It deserves a place next to love. Pessimism is a great fault. It is not fat, fatuous joy such as the world accepts. It is the enduring joy that bubbles up from all the grace of God in our possession, from the blessedness that is ours, that is undimmed by tribulation. The joy provided by the Holy Spirit is not limited by circumstances. No. Christian, no Christian can have joy if he depends upon the circumstances of life. The spirit life is characterized by looking unto Jesus, the ultimate finisher of our faith, which causes us to know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose, Romans 8, 28. In the scripture, joy and rejoicing are not the result of self effort, but are the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. You are filled my heart with greater joy than when they are green and new wine abound. That is Psalms 4, verse 7, and I V. Now, the Apostle Paul, writing from a prison dungeon, said, Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. Philippians 4, 4. Any man can rejoice in prison. Uh, any man who can rejoice in prison has to have a supernatural source of power. This supernatural joy is unavailable for any Christian regardless of his basic or natural temperament. Jesus said, These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy may be full. John 15, 11. This is only possible as we are filled with the Holy Spirit. Martin Luther said, God does not like doubt and dejection. He hates dreary doctrine, gloomy and melancholy thought. God likes cheerful heart. Christ says, Rejoice, for your names are written in heaven. Now, let's look at peace of nine. That is number three of nine. The third temperament traits of the spirit-filled man is peace. The preceding verse in Galatians 5 describes not only the works of the natural man without the spirit, but also his emotions. His emotional turbulence is described by hatred, variance, strivings, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies. We see that the further man gets from God, the less he knows of peace. The peace spoken of, of, uh, of here is really twofold. It is peace with God and the peace of God. The Lord Jesus said, Peace I live with you. My peace I give unto you. That's John 14, 28. The peace in leaves us is peace with God. My peace I give unto you is the peace of God. For in the same verse, it defines it as the peace of an untroubled heart. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. The preceding verse describes the coming of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the source of peace. Peace with God is a result of salvation by faith. Man outside of Jesus Christ knows nothing of peace in relationship with God because his sin is ever before him and he knows he is accountable before God at the judgment. However, when this individual takes Jesus Christ at his word and invites him into his life as Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ not only comes in as he promised to do in Revelation 3.20, but immediately cleanses all his sin. 1 John 1, 7 and 9. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 5 verse 1. The peace of God, the antidote to worry, is not as automatically possessed by Christians as the peace with God. <clears throat> Sorry there. This peace enables enabling one to be uncontrolled, untroubled in the face of difficult circumstances is illustrated by Lord Jesus when who was sound asleep in the lower part of the ship while the twelve disciples were frightened beyond rationality. Many are prone to worry, further complicating their emotional, physical and spiritual life. While those who believe God get a good night's sleep, are waking refreshed and available for God's use the next day. 
Just becoming a Christian does not spare us from difficult circumstances of life. However, the Holy Spirit's presence in our lives can supply us with one of His life's greatest treasures, the peace of God, in spite of any circumstances. The Apostle Paul had this in mind when he wrote the words, Be careful, worried, or anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. The peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. Philippians 4, 6-7 The Holy Spirit longs to give such peace to every believer. Let's look at long-suffering. Long-suffering of one of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Verse 4 The fourth temperament trait of the Spirit-filled man is long-suffering, also known as patience or endurance. It can be characterized by an ability to bear injuries or suffer reproof or affliction without answering in kind. As Apostle Peter said about the Lord Jesus, who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. And a long-suffering person is one who can do the manual, forgotten, and difficult tasks of life graciously as unto the Lord without complaining or sitting. He finishes his tasks or suffers affront while manifesting the loving spirit of Christ. Now, gentleness. The fifth one is gentleness. The fifth characteristic of the spirit-filled temperament is described in the King James Version as gentleness. This is a thoughtful, thoughtful, polite, gracious, considerate, understanding act of kindness stemming from a tender heart. The world in which we live knows little of such tender-heartedness. It is the result of the compassion of the Holy Spirit for a lost and dying humanity. The Lord Jesus' gentle spirit contrasted sharply with the disciples' cruel attitude toward the children who have, who had been brought by their parents to be blessed by him. The scripture tells us that the disciples rebuked those who brought them. But Jesus said, Suffer the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not. Mark 10, 13-14 this gentle characteristic of the Holy Spirit never asks such questions as how often must I forgive my brother when he sins against me or isn't there a limit to how much a person can stand? The Holy Spirit is able to give gentleness in the face of all kinds of pressure. Jesus who possessed the Holy Spirit without measure pictured himself as a shepherd gently caring for injured sheep and he through his followers tenderly cares today. Next is goodness. Goodness is the six characteristics of the spirit filled man is called goodness. This is benevolence in its purest sense. It includes hospitality and all acts of goodness that flow from an unselfish heart that is more interested in giving than receiving. Instead of bringing joy to someone else's life and an act of kindness, the self centered person sinks deeper and deeper in this law of dependency and gloom. D.L. Moody once stated that it was his custom, after presenting himself to the Holy Spirit and asking to be led of the Spirit to act upon these impulses which came to his mind, provided, did, provided they did not violate any known truth of Scripture. Generally speaking, that is a very good rule to follow, for it pays rich dividends in the mental health and the life of the giver. So let's look at faith. Faith, the seventh trait of Spirit-filled man, is faith. A complete abandonment to God and absolute dependence upon Him. This is a perfect antidote to fear, which causes worry, anxiety, and pessimism. So we're talking about faith now, the seventh trait of the spirit-filled man. It's, a, it's faith, a complete abandonment to God, and absolute dependence upon Him. This is a perfect antidote to fear, which causes worry, anxiety, and pessimism. Some commentators suggest that more than faith, more than faith is involved, namely faithfulness or dependability. A man who has spirits inspired faith will be fruitful and dependable. Many of God's people, like the nation of Israel, waste years in the desert of life because they do not believe God. Far too many Christians have grasshopper vision. They are like the ten faithless spies who saw the giants in the land of Canaan and came home to cry. We are as grasshoppers on their side. The Bible teaches that there are two sources of faith. The first source is the word of God in the life of the believer. Romans 10:17 states, Faith cometh by hearing 
and hearing by the word of God. The second is the Holy Spirit faith. It's a fruit of the Spirit. If you find that you have a temperament that is conducive to doubt, indecision, fear, then as a believer, you can look to the feeling of the Holy Spirit to give you a heart of faith which will dispel the emotions and actions of your natural nature, including fear, doubt, and anxiety. To take time, however, habits are binding chains. But God gives us a victory in Christ Jesus. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. That's Psalms 27 verse 14. So let's look at meekness. The eighth temperament trait of the spirit-filled man is meekness. The natural man is proud, egotistical, and self-centered. But when the Holy Spirit fills the life of an individual, he will be humble, mild, submissive, and easily entreated. Uh, The greatest example of meekness is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He was the creator of the universe and yet was willing to humble himself, take on the form of a servant, and become subject to the wings of humanity, even to the point of death, that he might purchase our redemption by his blood. Here we see the creator of man buffeted, ridiculed, abused, and spit, spat upon by his own creation. Yet he left us an example of not reviling again. Meekness is not natural for us. Only the supernatural indwelling spirit of God could cause any, any of us to react to the physical and emotional persecution. And meekness is a natural tendency to assert oneself, but even the most Angry temperament can be controlled by the feeling of the Holy Spirit and made to manifest this admirable trait of meekness. Let's look at self-control. The final temperament characteristics of the Holy Spirit-filled believer is self-control. The King James Version translates it temperance. Someone has defined it as self-control by the Holy Spirit. Self-control will solve the Christian's problem of emotional outbursts such as rage, anger, fear, jealousy and cause him to avoid emotional excess of any kind. The spirit controlled temperament will be one that is consistent, dependable and well ordered. It has occurred to me that all four of the basic temperament types have a common difficulty that will be overcome by the spirit filled trait of self control. That weakness is an inconsistent or ineffective devotional life. No Christian can be mature in Christ, steadily filled with the Holy Spirit, and usable in the hand of God unless he regularly feeds on the Word of God. The sanguine is too restless and weak-willed by nature to be consistent in anything, much less in getting up uh, a few minutes earlier to have a regular time of Bible reading and prayer. Mr. Choleric is by nature such a self-confident individual that even after he is converted, it takes some time for him to realize what the Lord Jesus meant when he said, Without me, you can do nothing. Mr. Melancholy is perhaps the most likely at the fore to be regular in his devotional life, except that his analytical ability often sends him off in the quest of some abstract theological hair-splitting truth rather than letting God speak to him concerning his personal needs. Mr. Phlegmatic is prone to recommend a regular quiet time as a necessary part of the Christian life, but if his slow, indolent, and often indifferent inclination is not disciplined by the Holy Spirit, he will never quit, quite get around to a regular feeding on God's Word. As you uh, look at these nine admirable traits of the spirit-filled man, you not only get a picture of what God wants you to be, but what he is willing to make you in spite of your natural temperament. It should, however, be borne in mind that no amount of self-improvement or self-effort can bring any of these traits into our lives without the power of the Holy Spirit. From this, we conclude that the most important single thing in the life of any Christian is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Sorry there. It is my conviction that God has given us at least one strength of the Spirit for every human weakness, the needs of the sanguine temperament. Sparky Sanguine needs at least six fruits of the strength of the Spirit to be the man or woman God wants him to be. He is by nature loving or compassionate, so he doesn't need that. Though the Spirit of God will direct and purify that love, he also is by nature joyful. So the Spirit doesn't have to supply joy. He also has a natural goodness trait, that is, he loves to do things, good things for other people. 
peace, however, is another matter. Sanguines are so restless by nature that they need the supernatural peace of God that only the Holy Spirit can supply. Whenever you see a combustible sanguine face pressure in an attitude of peace, you are looking at the miracle of God. Uh, long suffering, long suffering, which basically means endurance, is foreign to the nature of a sanguine. He usually leaves a sea of unfinished projects behind him unless filled with the Holy Spirit. The bull in the china shop treats of the sanguines are somehow replaced by the gentleness of the Spirit of God. One evidence of this is in their conversation. By nature, they are blunt, loud, hurtful in their humorous, humorous treatment of others, seldom are aware of how they have injured those who bear the brunt of their jokes. The gentleness of the Spirit of God will soften their injurious tongue. tongue. One of the chief problems of Sparky Sanguine is ego. To him, by nature, he is the greatest. But when the spirit of meekness controls his life, the sanguine ceases to think more highly of himself than he ought to, but rather has his trek of humility burning in his soul, another evidence of the supernatural power of God. Some of the lesser traits of a sanguine personality are his secret fears and insecurities. To such individuals, faith is a wonderful source of blessing. I have seen God's spirit not only supply the love, love staff spirit of a sanguine, but give him courage in the face of adversity okay the number one need of the sanguine is self-control we have seen that his natural problem of lack of self-discipline usually proves his undoing we all know capable loving charismatic sanguines who never live up to their potential and destroy themselves by lack of discipline the need of the choleric temperament if you listen to the hard driving activity prone choleric, you might get the feeling he doesn't have emotional needs. Don't you believe it? These insensitive, caustic people have many needs and everyone around them wishes they would get help somewhere. I have noticed that the choleric is the only one of the temperament that has a specific need for seven of the nine fruits or strengths of the Holy Spirit. We have already seen that the choleric is self-disciplined and long-suffering by nature. You recall we said he was strong-willed, determined, goal-oriented, and persistent. These traits stand in good stead when controlled by the Holy Spirit, for he is more likely to follow Jesus fully, energetically, and consistently. But even there, he is vulnerable to mistaking his self-will for the will of God. Okay, So the besetting temptation of choleric Christians is to set their minds on doing something and persistently push for it without knowing whether or not it is really the will of God. This may produce a seemingly productive Christian worker, but it does not make a happy Christian, nor does it make the best use of his talents. A spirit-filled choleric will always outperform a carnal choleric. Like every other temperament, as a choleric desperately needs the feeling of the Holy Spirit. The first and primary need of a choleric temperament is love and compassion. His insensitive and underdeveloped emotional nature is a real challenge to the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Holy Spirit, love is not a static emotion. That is, you cannot love without being motivated to do something to express it. And the object of our expression when that love comes from the Holy Spirit will always be other people. The choleric who manifests love to his family and associates is manifesting the supernatural strength of the Holy Spirit in control of his temperament. Although the cholerics are extremely hard to please by nature, they are not an unhappy lot as long as they are busy working toward one of their goals in life. The joy the Holy Spirit supplies is not related to man's effort, but we characterize a choleric event, a choleric event in the face of adversity. When the Holy Spirit fills choleric lives, they will still be activity bound, but there is a sense of peace and a loss of that frenetic force that often drives them to an early grave. Cholerics desperately need peace with God. Whenever you find a gentle choleric, you find a walking illustration of the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit of God. But that is not their natural forte. The best place to manifest that spirit in Dios gentleness is in their speech patterns. No one can be more caustic and cutting than a choleric. And when the choleric tongue is modified to gracious speech and gentle approval, you know he is controlled by the Holy Spirit. Cholerics need goodness. That is, they need to be involved in the goodness of God. It is important to them to invest their lives in something so worthwhile it lifts them into a new dimension of effectiveness and productivity. The Spirit of God alone provides that for a Christian choleric. 
interestingly enough, cholerics are not fearful people. They have tones, tones of self-confidence. However, one of the lessons they must learn early in their Christian life is not by might, nor by power, nor even by their choleric spirit, but by the, my spirit, said the Lord. I have found that the temptation to which many choleris give vent is to rush off in their own direction instead of putting their faith in the living God and following Him. <clears throat> Sorry there. A choleric is not meek by nature. Cholerics universally equate meekness and weakness. It is a happy day for the choleric who understands that God will not tolerate a haughty, proud spirit, but will bring such individuals down and humble them. It is much better for a choleric to humble himself under the mighty hand of God and to develop meekness before the Holy Spirit has to do it for him. The needs of melancholy temperament. God used more melancholies in the Bible than all the other temperaments put together. That should be good news to the average melancholy individual who is often plagued by feelings of inadequacy in spite of recognized talents and creativity. It has um, long been a mystery to me that those melancholy individuals who are endowed by their creator with the greatest number of talents seem to have the least confidence in themselves. This is probably due to their everlasting tendency towards self-criticism and self-condemnation. In part of that, however, down through the years, both in the Old Testament and New Testament and in the history of Christianity, God has transformed many, a self-sacrificing, gentle, melancholy, into a faithful, consistent servant when once filled with the Holy Spirit. Melancholies don't need a great deal of slow suffering and self-control. For if their motivation is oriented by the Spirit of God and they are instructed by the Word of God, they make extremely effective Christian workers, no not for their flamboyant style, but for their self-sacrificing, consistent spirit, it seems easier to challenge a melancholy to a lifetime of service for Jesus than any other temperament. That too is probably because of their natural tendency towards self-sacrifice. The genuineness of making a lifelong investment may cause greater than once is probably what does it. However, <clears throat> I am not blind to the fact that they nevertheless are in need of five specific fruits from the Holy Spirit. Nothing turns a melancholist life around like the love that is characteristic of the spirit-filled life. By nature, a melancholy is self-centered. His tendency towards perfectionism makes him very impatient with the idiosyncrasies and carelessness of his fellow men. But when the Holy Spirit fills him with the love of Christ, a love literally transforms his nature. Joy is an absolute necessity for every melancholy to replace his natural, morose, moody, gripping spirit. It seems difficult for melancholies to understand that they must reflect the joy of the Lord. However, once that concept grips their heart, it can have a transforming effect on their entire being and make them delightful individuals to be around. The peace of the Holy Spirit is a welcome tunic, tonic to the melancholy whose inner thoughts fluctuate from criticism airy condemnation to hostility and revenge and back to suspicion and fear. You can well imagine the influence of providing a pervading spirit of God's peace that strengthens this aspect of the melancholy's temperament. It is absolutely essential for melancholy to invest its life sacrificially in the doing of goodness for other people. Fortunately, once he is filled with love that gets his eyes off himself, his next objective is to apply this new strength or com uh, or compulsion within him to act to acts of kindness to other souls on behalf of the gospel the Lord Jesus Christ in so doing he brings fulfillment to himself there's a trace of the haughty spirit in a melancholy the spirit filled life however injects a meekness or humility that although foreign to his natural characteristics brings great balance to his life and makes him less critical of others and easier to get along with the sick strength of the Holy Spirit needed so desperately by melancholy is fate. This will get him out of his ever-present tendency to limit himself by unbelief and will inspire him to take steps of faith in the use of his natural characteristics. Most melancholy temperaments immobilize themselves by fear of the future, for example. What they need desperately from God is realization that is with them constantly to supply their every need. One of the tilings I hope you have noticed about these spiritual uh, strengths provided by the Holy Spirit is how very practical they are for everyday living. Every temperament has a besetting sin on an area of weakness that so easily besets him or causes him to stumble. 
the Holy Spirit fortifies this area of person's weakness and though he doesn't change the person's temperament from his basic rules, he so strengthens it in the area of weakness that it seems that that person <laughs> yeah the Holy Spirit fortifies this area of the person's weakness and though he doesn't change the person's temperament from his basic rule, Root, uh, root, he so strengthens it in the area's weakness that it seems that that person has been transformed by walking under the control of the Holy Spirit. So, mark the word transformation as highlighted by uh, Paul in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. The needs of phlegmatic temperament. <coughs> Sorry, there. The phlegmatics are nice people by nature. I have often said in public that phlegmatics act more like Christians before they become Christians than most of the rest of us do afterwards. They are quiet, gentle, gracious people, and yet phlegmatics are as needy as any of the other temperaments. Their natural tendency to be gentle should not be confused with the gentleness or kindness of the Holy Spirit of God. Phlegmatics are gentle in the treatment of other people, regardless of their spiritual motivation. When filled with the Holy Spirit, however, that gentility characterizes itself in a motivated servant spirit that makes them a great asset to any family, church, or organization. Like all the other temperaments, the primary need of phlegmatic is love and compassion for other people. The most underdeveloped part of phlegmatic nature is motivation. The love of Holy Spirit motivates him to utilize his gracious, gentle spirit in the service of Christ. Okay? Endurance is one of the great needs of the phlegmatic. He finds it only in the power of the Holy Spirit. Not only the are phlegmatic good procrastinators, but they are also respectable quitters. The Holy Spirit will prompt them to keep on. Every church has more than its share of nice, kind, gentle people who warm the pews, but never get involved in the work of the Lord. The antidote to that is the fruit of goodness. That is good act of service for Jesus Christ once they have committed themselves to a Sunday school class, a department superintendentship, Monday night church visitation, or some other form of Christian service. They do an excellent job if they will accept their assignment in the first place. One of the principal needs of the phlegmatic is fit to overcome his fears and worry. No one can be a more professional warrior than the phlegmatic, but when filled with the Holy Spirit, he will have faith to trust God to do the impossible, even for himself. Phlegmatics without the Holy Spirit tend toward an increasing lifestyle of passivity until they are motivated by the self-control of the Holy Spirit and recognize their self-indulgent attitude. The self-control of the Holy Spirit of God will tend to cure their tendency toward procrastination. One fulfillment in life comes in direct relationship to our being filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, how to be filled with the Holy Spirit? One of the things I have tried to communicate in all my books on temperament is that far more important than what is your personal temperament is the question, are you filled with the Holy Spirit? It's almost impossible to exaggerate how dependent we are on the Holy Spirit. We are dependent on Him for convicting us of sin before and after our salvation, for giving us understanding of the gospel causing us to be born again, empowering us to witness, guiding us in our prayer life, in fact, for everything. It's no wonder that evil spirits have tried to counterfeit the work of the Holy Spirit and confuse his work. There's probably no subject in the Bible upon which there's more confusion than the, that of being filled with the Holy Spirit. There are many fine Christian people who seem to equip the filling of the Holy Spirit with external sign. There are other with external uh, there are other Christians who because of excessive uh, because of excesses observed or heard of in this direction have all but eliminated the teaching of the feeling of the Holy Spirit from their experiences. They do not recognize his importance in their lives. Satan places two obstacles before men. He tries to keep them from receiving Christ as Savior and if he fails in this, he then tries to keep men from understanding the importance of the work of the Holy Spirit. One of the false impressions gained from people and not from the Word of God is that there is some special feeling when one is filled with the Holy Spirit. Before we examine how to be filled with the Holy Spirit, let us examine what the Bible teaches we can ex uh, expect when we are filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, four major results of being filled with the Holy Spirit. There are four specific areas uh, results of the Spirit-filled life. 
all guaranteed by the Bible. Consider them carefully for they are true marks of being a spirit-filled Christian. Number one, the nine temperament strengths of the spirit-filled life. Galatians 5, 23 We have already examined this trait in detail and I've seen that they provide a strength for every natural weakness. Any individual who is filled with the Holy Spirit is going to manifest the characteristics of love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, faith, and self-control. He does not have to act out a rule. He will be this way when the Spirit has controlled his nature, regardless of his original temperament. When the Holy Spirit fills your life, you will still be yourself, minus the domination of your weakness. When filled with the Spirit, we all are able to be used of God in the areas our natural talents or strengths has given to us by God. Now, a joyful, thankful heart, number two, a joyful, thankful heart and a submissive spirit, Ephesians 5, 18, 21. When the Holy Spirit fills the life of a believer, the Bible tells us he will cause that believer to have a singing, thankful heart and a submissive spirit. And be not drunk with wine, wherein in excess, but be filled uh, with uh, the Holy Spirit. Speaking to, your, speaking to yourself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all the things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. A single, a singing, grateful heart and a submissive spirit, independent of circumstances, are so unnatural that they can only be ours through the feeling of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God is able to change the gloomy or gripping heart into a song-filled, thankful heart. He's also able to solve man's natural rebellion problem by increasing his faith to the point that he really believes the best way to live is in submission to the will of God, God's Word, and God's Spirit. The same three results of spirit-filled life are also results of the word-filled life as found in Galatians 3, 16 to 18. But they will let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. And whatever you do in words and deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God, the Father of Him. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit to the Lord. It is no accident that we find the result of spirit-filled life and those of the world-filled life to be one and the same. The Lord Jesus said that the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. He also said of the word of God, thy word is truth. It is easily understood why the world-filled life causes the same results as spirit-filled life. For the Holy Spirit is the author of the word of God. The Christian who is spirit-filled will be word-filled. And the word filled Christian who obeys the Spirit will be spirit filled. Number three, sign that you are filled. Power for our witness about Jesus Christ. Act 1 8. The Lord Jesus told his disciples that it is expedient, necessary for you that I go away. But if I go not away, the Comforter, Holy Spirit, will not come unto you. John 16 7. That explains why the last thing Jesus did before he ascended into heaven was to tell his disciples, But you shall receive power, and that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses unto me. Witnesses unto me. Acts 1 8. Even though the disciples had spent three years with Jesus, had heard these messages several times, and were the best trained witnesses he had, he still instructed them not to depart from Jesusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father. Acts 1 4. All of their training obviously was incapable of producing fruit without the power of the Holy Spirit. And uh, when the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, they witnessed in his power and the 3,000 persons were saved. Power to witness in the Holy Spirit is not always, in this, it's not always discernible, but must be accepted by faith. When we have met the condition for feeling of the Holy Spirit, we should be careful to believe we have witnessed in the power of the Holy Spirit with there or not we see the result. It is possible to witness in the power of the Holy Spirit and still not see an individual come to a saving knowledge of Christ. For in the sovereign plan of God, he has chosen never to violate the right of man's free choice. We cannot always equip success in witnesses the power to witness. And then the fourth sign that you are filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will glorify Jesus Christ. John 16, 13, 14. How be it when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will shew you things to come. 
he shall glorify me for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you the fundamental principle should always be kept in mind regarding the work of the Holy Spirit. He does not glorify himself, but the Lord Jesus Christ. The late F.M. Mayer told the story of a missionary who came to him at a Bible conference after he had spoken on the subject on how to be filled with the Holy Spirit. She confessed that she was never consciously filled with the Holy Spirit and was going to go up to prayer chapel and spend the day in soul searching to see if she could receive his feeling. Late that evening, she came back just as Mayer was leaving the auditorium. He asked, how was it here, sister? I am not quite sure, she responded, explaining her day's activities of reading the, Bible, the word, praying, confessing her sins, and asking for the feeling of the Holy Spirit. She then said, I do not feel com particularly filled the Holy Spirit, but never have I been so conscious of the presence of the Lord Jesus in my life. To which Mayer replied, sister, that is the Holy Spirit. He glorifies Jesus. Hmm. Let us summarize what we can expect when filled with the Holy Spirit, very simply. The ninth temperament characteristics of the Spirit is singing, thankful heart that gives us a submissive attitude and a power to witness. These characteristics will glorify the Lord Jesus Christ without uh, what uh, Jesus Christ. What about certain feelings or ecstatic experiences? The Bible does not tell us to expect these things when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, and we should not expect what the Bible does not promise. The infilling of the Holy Spirit in the, the feeling of the Holy Spirit is not optional equipment in the Christian life, but the command of God. Ephesians 5.18 tells us, And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. His God commands us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It must be possible for us to be filled with the Spirit. I would like to give five <coughs> simple steps for being filled with the Holy Spirit. Self-examination. Acts 20. Uh, verse 28 and 1 Corinthians 11 28. The Christian interested in feeling of the Holy Spirit must regularly take heed to examine himself, not to see if he measures up to the standard of other people or the tradition and requirement of his church, but to the previously mentioned result of being filled with the Holy Spirit. If he does not find he is glorifying Jesus, if he does not have power to witness, or if he lacks a joyful submissive spirit or the nine temperament trait of the Holy Spirit, then his self-examination will reveal those areas in which he is confident and uncover the sin that causes sin. Number two, confession of all known sin. First John 1 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. After examining ourselves in the light of the word of God, we should confess all sin brought to mind by the Holy Spirit, including those characteristics of the spirit-filled life that we lack. Until we acknowledge our sin, our lack of compassion, our lack of self-control, our lack of humility, our anger instead of gentleness, our bitterness instead of kindness, our unbelief instead of faith, we will never have the feeling of the Holy Spirit. However, the moment we recognize these deficiencies as sin and confess them to God, He will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Until we have done this, we cannot have the feeling of the Holy Spirit, for He fills only clean vessels. Now. Uh, number three, submit yourself completely to God. Three or five, Romans 6, 11 to 13. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ. Our Lord, let not sin therefore, <coughs> <coughs> sorry there, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that it should obey it in the lost year of, neither yield ye yourselves as instruments of a righteousness unto sin, but you yourself unto God as those that are alive from the dead, all your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Do not make the mistake of being afraid to give yourself to God. Romans 8.32 tells us, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? If God loved us so much as to give his son to die for us, certainly he is interested in nothing but our good. Therefore we can trust him with our lives. You will never find a miserable Christian in the center of the will of God. I repeat that. You will never find a miserable Christian in the center of the will of God. Ephesians 5, 18 says, Be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. When a man is drunk, he is dominated by alcohol. So with the feeling of the Holy Spirit, man's action must be dominated by and dictated by the Holy Spirit. For consecrated Christian, this is often the most difficult thing to do. 
But we can always find some worthy purposes for our lives, but not realizing that we are often filled with ourselves rather than with the Holy Spirit as we seek to serve the Lord. When you give your life to God, do not attach any strings or condition to it. He is such a God of love that you can safely give yourself without reservation, knowing that His plan and use of life is far better than yours. And remember, the attitude of yieldedness is absolutely necessary for the feeling of God's Spirit. Your will is the will of the flesh. The Bible says that the flesh profit nothing, profited nothing. Someone has suggested um, that being yielded to the Spirit is being available to spirits. Peter and John in Acts 3 make a good example of that. They were on their way to the temple to pray when they saw the lame man begging arms. Because they were sensitive to the Holy Spirit, they healed him in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. The man began leaping about and praising God until a crowd gathered. Peter, still sensitive to the Holy Spirit, began preaching. Many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of men was about 5,000, Acts 4. four. Many times I fear we are so engrossed in some good Christian activity that we are not available when the Spirit leads. When a Christian yields himself unto God as those that are alive from the dead, he takes time to do what the Spirit directs him to do. Okay, number four, <coughs> ask to be filled with the Holy Spirit, Luke eleven thirteen. If ye then, being evil, know how to live, give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? When a Christian has examined himself, confessed all known sin, and yielded himself without reservation to God, he is then ready to do the one thing he must do to receive the Spirit. See, very simple. To ask to be filled with the Holy Spirit. The Lord Jesus compares this to our treatment of our earthly children. Certainly, a good father will not make his children beg for something he commanded them to have. How much less does God make us beg to be filled with the Holy Spirit? But don't forget step five. So five, believe you have you are filled with the Holy Spirit and thank him for his feeling. And he that doubted is damned if he eats, because he eateth not of faith, for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Romans 14 23. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. First Thessalonians 5 18. For many Christians the battle is won or lost right here. After examining themselves, confessing all known sin, yielding themselves to God, and asking for his feeling, they, f- they are faced with a decision to believe they are filled or to go away in unbelief, in which case they have sinned, for what, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. The same Christian who tells the new convert to take God at his word concerning salvation finds it difficult to heed his own advice concerning the feeling of the Holy Spirit if you have filled if you have fulfilled the first four steps then by faith thank god for its feeling don't wait for feelings or for physical signs fasten your faith to the word of god which is independent of your feeling believing we are filled with the spirit is merely taking god at his word and that is the only absolute this world has matthew 24 uh, 35 so a common question most common questions I'm asked after my lectures on the spiritual life for overcoming temperament weakness is how often should I ask to be filled with the Holy Spirit? My answer is every time you think you are not. Some people teach, some Bible teach, teach, teachers think the spirit filled is an feeling is an automatic whenever we ask forgiveness for our sins. First John 1 7 to 9. Personally, I'm not convinced. I like to make sure by asking. In fact, I ask for his feeling when I awaken in the morning and many times through the day. The Greek in Ephesians 5.18 literally means keep on being filled with the Spirit. Occasionally, someone protests, but that is all too simple. Being filled with the Spirit must be much more complex. Why? As an eight-year-old boy, I asked the Lord Jesus to come into my heart. He instantly answered my request. Why should he not answer when I asked to be filled with the Holy Spirit? A.B. Simpson used to say, being filled with the Spirit is as easy as breathing. You can simply breathe out and breathe in. One of the reasons some Christians are reluctant to think they are filled with the Spirit is that they don't see an immediate change in their lives or the changes of short duration. Two factors have important bearing on this. Temperament and habit. And they work together. The weakness of our temperament have created strong habits that involuntarily recall. For illustration, let us consider a fear-prone, melancholy, or phlegmatic Christian. These people have a deeply ingrained habit of doubt negativism, worry, and anxiety. I can predict the thinking pattern of such a person after he follows the five steps of being filled with the Spirit. Before long, his negative thinking habit will stare doubt 
Am I filled with the Spirit? I don't feel any different. I am still afraid. This mental attitude is sin, and the Spirit feeling and control ends. What such people need to realize is that our feelings are the result of thought patterns. We need to learn that feelings are reliable only when they are based on truth and righteousness. God's people need to fill their minds with the Word of God, so their feelings will correspond to God's. The feelings, let me read that again. What such people need to, uh, uh, this, these people with mental attitude of sin and spirit feeling and control, why it ends, um, uh, I will take a step. Forward. These people have a deeply ingrained habit of uh, doubt, negativism, worry, anxiety. I can predict the thinking pattern of such a person after he follows the five steps of being filled with the Spirit. Before long, his negative thinking habit will stare doubt. Am I filled with the Spirit? I don't feel any different. I'm still afraid. This mental attitude is sin. The Spirit feeling and control ends. What such people need to realize is that our feelings are the result of thought patterns. We need to learn that feelings are reliable only when they are based on truth and righteousness. God's people need to fill their minds with the Word of God. So their feelings will correspond to God's. The feelings of perennial doubt who is filled with the Spirit will gradually change, but it will take time. If he looks to the Lord for mercy and forgiveness each time he feels doubtful or unbelieving, he will gradually be assured by the Lord. But if he continues to think negatively or doubtfully and justify it by saying, I have always been this way, he will remain that way. Or he may get worse because he is quenching the Holy Spirit by indulging in his sin and etching the habit deeper uh, on his mind. Mr. Sanguine and Mr. Choleric have a similar problem with their pet sin of anger. It isn't long after they are filled with the Holy Spirit that their ingrained anger feelings rise up to grieve the Holy Spirit. Unless they immediately confess this sin, they will no longer be filled with the Spirit and the old feelings will control them. Each time they think self-righteously of how they have been offended or insulted or cheated, they cultivate feelings of hostility. These easily triggered, triggered feelings are the result of years of hostile thoughts that can be overcome only as the Spirit of God is given access to and the control of conscious and subconscious mind. It replaces these hostile thoughts with love, kindness, and gentleness, but it will take time for a permanent change to be accomplished. How to Walk in the Spirit Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in mind in step with the Spirit, as Galatians 5.25. Walking in the Spirit and being filled by the Holy Spirit are not one. And the same thing, though they are very closely related. Having followed the five simple steps for the filling of the Holy Spirit, it is then essential to learn how to walk daily in the Spirit. Being filled with the Spirit is just the beginning of Christian victory. We must walk in the Spirit to be effective. Galatians 5.16 It is one thing to start out in the Spirit-filled life and quite another to walk day by day in the control of the Spirit. The flowing procedure for walking in the Spirit can be a practical tool for victorious daily living. Number 1 uh, make the feeling of the Holy Spirit a daily priority. You cannot walk in the Spirit unless you sincerely want to and unless you have His feeling. As we have already seen, old habit patterns sneak back to haunt us. If we enjoy them more than the peace of God, we will indulge the sins of the flesh. Let's be honest. Lust, worry, self-pity and anger are fun temporarily. Only when we want the feeling of the Holy Spirit more than anything else in the world are we willing to give up lesser emotional satisfaction of loss, worry, self-pity, and anger. Number two, develop a keen sensitivity to sin. Sin short circuits the power of the Holy Spirit. The moment we are conscious of any sin, we should confess it immediately. So the time between grieving or quenching uh, the spirit and restatement is minimal. The main advantage of the study of temperament is that we can diagnose our most common weaknesses. Consequently, we are on guard for the sin that does so easily beset us. When he rears his ugly head, confess it, forget it, God does so. You might as well and press on toward the fulfillment of the will of God for your life. The main secret of victorious living among those I have counseled has been the practice of instant confession. Confession. Daily read and study God's word. It is my conviction after a good deal of observation that it is impossible for a Christian to walk in the spirit unless he develops a habit of regularly feeding his mind and heart upon the word of God. One of the reasons Christians do not feel as good God 
does about life issues is that they do not know God's way from his word. These are feelings that are produced by our thought processes who feel as carnal worldlings do if we feed our minds on the wisdom of the world. We feed our minds on the word of God who feel as the spirit does about life issues. Remember that it takes some time to reorient reorient our minds from human wisdom to divine wisdom. So regular reading essential. Sometimes Christians object that this will make them legalists. Yet they don't seem to view coming to the table three times a day as legalistic. We do it because we sense a need and enjoy eating. In the same way we can feed spiritually on God's world from a sense of need, but it takes time to build our, uh, our spiritual appetite. Many Christians feel feels something is very wrong if they miss reading the word of God, but they don't start out that way. A consistent feeding of one's mind upon the word of God produces some interesting results. Consider the following revolutionary benefit. John 1, 8. It makes your way prosperous and gives success. Psalm 1, 3. It produces truthfulness. Psalm 1, 1 9, 11. It keeps us from sin. John 14, 21. God reveals himself increasingly to keep us of his word. John 15, 3. The word cleanses us. John 15, 7. The word produces power and prayer. John 15, 11. The word brings joy to our hearts. 1 John 2, 13 to 14, the world gives victory over the wicked one. With these transforming results from filling our minds with God's word, it is a tragedy that so many Christians live a second-rate life with feelings of insecurity, uncleanness, discontent, anxiety, and impotence. The character of our feelings depends on the character of our thoughts, and the sincere Christian should ask himself, what is shaping and filling my thoughts? A careful comparison of the spirit-filled life, Ephesians 5, 18 to 21, with the word-filled life, Colossians 3, 15 to 17, is revealing. Both passages promises a song in your heart, a time-giving attitude, and a submissive spirit. A mind that is filled with and yielded to the word of God will produce the same effect on the emotions of the mind filled with and yielded to the Holy Spirit. We may legitimately conclude from this that the filling of the Spirit and walking in the Spirit depend upon our being filled with the Word of God. Reading the Bible at night is especially helpful. The mind digests the events and thoughts of the day, particularly the last things we think about before going to sleep. For that reason, it is very profitable to read God's Word just before retiring. That way you can go to sleep thinking about the things just read. It is amazing how this helps awaken with a positive outlook for the day. Get into the habit of reading the word just before sleeping. Your subconscious mind will mold your feelings in God's pattern. Another valuable habit is meditation. The mind is always working and, our will, and will determine whether our mind works for or against us. To work for good, the mind must meditate on the truths and insights of God's word. There is one catch you must memorize in order to meditate pro- probably, uh, profitably. Because you can't meditate on what you don't know intimately. Whether it is a phrase, concept, or a whole verse of scripture, you must memorize it in order to meditate on it. A simple method I use to inspire meditation is to write down special verses that bless my soul. Then put the sheet of paper in my Bible or notebook. I learn, I learn at least one of these verses every week. It is hard work, but I don't know any mentally lazy Christian who work in the spirit. Number four. Guard against grieving the Holy Spirit. The next step for walking in the Spirit is an extension of step 2, developing a sensitivity to sin. Ephesians 4 30 32 is declared that all forms of hostility, including anger, bitterness, and enmity, grieve the Holy Spirit. All anger prone believers should memorize these three verses and develop a particular sensitivity to hostility. In addition to making instant confession, they should resolve to be loving, kind, tender-hearted, and forgiving toward others. This grace is markedly unnatural for a sanguine or a choleric, but the Holy Spirit will develop in the believer a new capacity for thoughtfulness and love. The importance of our will becomes apparent at this point of walking in the Spirit. When we feel the bloodshed of injustice of someone's wrath, we can hit the offender or forgive and pray for him. Our overall feelings as well as our walk in the Spirit depend upon our decision. Don't be surprised if you fail repeatedly at first, but be sure to confess the sin as soon as you are aware of grieving the Spirit and let Him reestablish your walk as you choose to forgive and to let the Holy Spirit react through you with the patience and love you will find your temperament weakness changing into strength. Number five, 
<clears throat> avoid quenching the spiritual fear and warning worry according to first Thessalonians 5 16 to 19 we quench the holy spirit when we doubt and resist his dealing in our lives when the christian says i doubt i don't understand why god let this awful thing happen to me he has already quenched the spirit through fear the christian who is trusting god could face the same characteristics and say i thank god he's in control of my life I don't understand he's dealing with me right now, but I trust his promise that he will never leave me and will supply my every need. We have seen that melancholy and phlegmatic people have a predisposition toward fear, just as the more extroverted temperaments have a predisposition this disposition toward anger. Some people possess both introvertive and extroverted temperaments and consequently may have deep problems with both fear and anger. God's grace is sufficient to cure both problems through his Holy Spirit. But if you have these tendencies, you need to watch carefully your reaction to seemingly unfavorable events. If you groan or complain inwardly, you have already quenched the Holy Spirit. This can be remedied immediately if you're willing to call your doubt induced complaining exactly what it is seen and ask God to transform these habit pattern and fill you uh, with his spirit. God is not nearly so interested in changing circumstances as he is in changing people. There is no victory to live without worry when there is nothing to worry about. And becoming a Christian did not exempt you from trouble. Job said, yet man is born unto trouble as a spark fly upward. John 5, 7. Jesus warned us we will face tribulation in this world. The Bible tells us God sends testing to strengthen us. Many Christians flung the test by seeking their removal rather than reigning obedience in the spirit. It is impossible for a fear-prone Christian to walk in the spirit any length of time without strong effusions of God's word to encourage his faith. The more God's word fills his mind, the more his feelings will abound in faith. But warriors usually enjoy wallowing in their misery. Warriors usually enjoy war in their misery, especially with God watching the piteous sin. All warriors, warriors should memorize Philippians 4, 6, 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God transcends all understanding will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. This verse is direct prayer to be made with thanksgiving. You cannot genuinely pray with thanksgiving and finish with the same body you started with. Consider the, the following two prayers and the emotions they create offered by Christian parents with a sick child. Dear Lord, we come to you on behalf of our little girl so near that. The doctor tells us there is no hope for her. Please, dear Lord, heal her. You know how much she means to us. If this sickness is caused by sin or in our lives, forgive and cleanse us that she may live. After all, the other tragedies in our lives, we do not think we can bear another. In Jesus' name, Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, this is another prayer coming from somebody else. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that we are your children and can look to you at this time of need. You know the report of the doctor. And you have promised that all things work together for good to folks like us. We don't understand our dear child's sickness, but we know you love us and are more than able to heal her. We commit our little bird body to you, Father, asking for her healing according to your perfect will. We dedicate her to you before she was born. And we thank you that you are able to supply all our needs right now, as well as others, ours. In Jesus' name, Amen. It is obvious. Uh, which set of parents will feel the peace of God and which couple will wring their hands in anguish during this time of deep need. The difference comes in learning the attitude of thanksgiving from the word of God. As you think the above prayer is hypothetical or idealistic, let me share a personal experience. The blonde, blue eye, Corey named Laurie that God sent to us is the apple of my heart. Several years ago, I stood at her bedside in children's hospital and prayed that prayer. Frankly, I don't know how people without Jesus Christ go through such trials. My wife and I can testify that in spite of Laurie's raging fever and delirium and no known hope, God impacted peace to our troubled heart. However, not until we prayed with thanksgiving beside her oxygen tent did we receive that peace. If you tend to worry or grumble, you will find that you are not a very thankful person. You may be a fine person in many other respects, but unless you learn to be thankful, you can never walk far in the spirit, nor will you consistently, um, will you be consistently happy. The secret to a thankful attitude is in coming to God 
intimately as he reveals himself in his word. This will require consistent Bible reading, study, and meditation. When your faith is established through the word, it is easier to give thanks, but it's still in the act of the will. If you have not accepted his full leading for your life, you will complain because you doubt things will turn out all right, and doubt, doubt quenches the spirit and sidetracks your real progress. One last practical suggestion for working in spirits is in order. Although mental attitude is important at all times, prayer is of paramount importance twice during each day, when we go to bed and when we rise. It is very important to pray with thanksgiving as well as to read the scripture at night, though it may be hard. The other tragic, strategic time to give thanks is the first thing in the morning. The psalmist helps us. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We we'll rejoice and be glad in it. After beginning your day with thanksgiving, yield yourself anew to God according to Romans 6, 11, 13. Tell him, tell him you are available to share your faith with the needy when he sends to you. Yield your lips uh, to the Holy Spirit and let him open the conversation. Walk in the Spirit and you will bear fruit for God. As soon as you sense you have, a, you have grieved or quenched the Spirit, confess your sin and again ask for his feeling. If you follow these steps, your spirit will improve regardless of your temperament. And when you improve your spirit, you permit God to make the most of, of your life. This brings us to the end of today's title, Perfect Relationship. 24 Tools for Building Bridges to Harmony and Taking Down Walls of Conflict in Our Relationship. Understanding Your Temperament and That of Others. Episode 3, Part 2, Strengthening Our Weaknesses. I hope you are blessed by this post. We continue episode 4, part 2, in the course of the week. Until then, have a wonderful week in, week in His presence. Shalom, this is Ambassador Mandi Ogu Ojo or Ojo Ogbe, God's Ego Ministries, where we are seeding the nations with God's Word um, and God is transforming lives through His timeless truth. We're one in Christ Jesus, so let's stay one. Our content, over 2 million of them, is at otakada.org. That is O T A K A D A. Dot org and you can reach us via whatsapp at plus two three four eight zero three two eight three five three four eight plus two three four eight zero three two eight three five three four eight or uh, with our u.s number this is a nigerian number or the u.s number plus one three zero two two six eight six three uh one three plus uh one three zero two two six eight six three one three may the lord bless and keep you Lord cause his content to shine upon you greatly and give you peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. May he cause the lines to fall for you in pleasant places. He said, this is the day the Lord have made and we are rejoicing and, and we're glad in it. May he, he says that uh, the day to favor you has come. Yes, the set time has come. So shall favor and compass around you all around today. Doors are falling flat in front of you. The place you've been turned down, you have been received now only walk in his plans and purposes for your life so shall it be in jesus name have a blessed week in him and work in the spirit so take in the spirit and walk in the spirit in jesus name amen amen so father thank you for the end of these and may the lord bless and keep in jesus name amen <music>